many people come here to listen to you and to, and to copy and understand your investment philosophy. But why don't more people, in your opinion, try to copy your investment vehicle, a corporation that pays no dividends? I don't really think if there were, I, I think there are other things that are probably better to copy about Berkshire, but they don't get copied either. It was always interesting to me how few people, everybody read Graham's, and, and they, they didn't really disagree with him. They just didn't like following him because it didn't, it didn't promise enough in a, in a sense. I mean, people, people really wanted something very quickly. In terms of not paying dividends, we don't pay dividends because we think we can turn every dollar we retain into more than a dollar of market value. I mean, the only reason for us to keep your money is if it becomes worth more by us keeping it than it would be worth if we gave it to you. And if we can create more than a dollar of market value for every dollar we keep, uh, you're better off whether you want to take that dollar out by selling a little piece of your stock or whether you continue to leave it in. That's the test. If we come to the conclusion that we can't do that, and we could come to the conclusion sometime, then we should distribute it to you. The interesting thing is, we're in certain businesses, for example, C's Candy being one, we don't have a way to intelligently use all of the money that C's generates within the C's Candy Company. So if C's were a standalone company, it would pay very large dividends. Not because it, you know, just had some dividend pol paying policy, it would be simply because we wouldn't have a way of using, in this case, $30 million a year intelligently in expanding that business. The Buffalo News is the same way. We, we don't have a way of using money within that specific business intelligently to use the, the money that it generates. We hope that in the overall Berkshire Hathaway scheme of things, that we can intelligently use the money that the companies in aggregate uh, uh, generate for us. And we think so far we have, and we think the prospects are reasonably good that we can continue to do that. But dividend policy should really be determined by that criteria, also bearing in mind the possibilities of repurchase of stock, too. But they should be determined by whether a dollar left in the business is worth more than uh, to the shareholder than a dollar paid out. Someplace like Coca-Cola, you know, it, if Coca-Cola had paid no dividends, and simply repurchase shares and develop the bottling system and done the things that they have, the shareholders probably would have been even better off. They've been sensationally well off as it is, but they probably would have been even better off um, than they have been uh, with, with the dividend policy they have had. And that's Gillette and Disney and, and companies of that sort that have got these terrific opportunities to use capital uh, within the business or to repurchase shares of a company that simply can't be replaced. If, if that usually is the best use of capital, it's probably better than dividends. And, uh, you know, we have written some about that, uh, Martin, but it, uh, people usually keep doing what they've been doing. It, uh, it's, it's, they're hard to change. Charlie? Well, it's interesting that you take that simple standard, you should retain money if you, if you can make it worth more. Uh, than it is by retaining it. That is not the standard thing that's taught in the corporate finance departments of our major universities. Uh, why do we have this simple idea and they have another one? Time after time we find that so. Uh, I, I've tried to understand why they think the way they do and I have great difficulty with it. I've just concluded that they're wrong and but, but that, <laughs> But that isn't enough. There has to be a reason why so many smart people are that wrong. And uh, uh, that's a story for another day. But, but there are things gravely wrong with, with uh, American education that I hope that Berkshire Hathaway is slowly helping to fix. Can you imagine if the you know, pick any one of you here, and let's say the two of us were in a business together, you know, it was earning $100,000 a year. How would we decide whether to leave the 100,000 each year? And we, it'd be exactly what we've talked about here. If we thought the 100,000 would translate into a present value of more than 100,000 by some action, we'd leave it in. And if it didn't, we'd take it out. You know, and uh, it doesn't seem to register generally uh, 
and incidentally, in our own case, we'll probably go too long uh, before we come to the conclusion that we're not really using it that effectively because there'll be a certain denial we'll go through and we'll say, well, that was just temporary last year. But, but <laughs> that, will, that is our approach and we'll, we'll do our best to apply it.